Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome our faculty, staff, alumni, and distinguished guests, as well as those of you who are joining via live stream uh, for this special event. My name is Gary May, and I'm the chancellor here at UC Davis, and I'm excited to be here to kick off the first ever UC Davis Financial Times Biz Quiz with tonight's special interview of Jenny Johnson by Peter Spiegel. Business schools play a vital role in developing an, an educated workforce that keeps California's economy and our national economy comp competitive. I'd like to thank the business schools in the University of California system who fielded teams for Biz Quiz this year, the UCLA Anderson School of Management, the UC Riverside School of Business, UC San Diego Rady School of Management, and our own UC Davis Graduate School of Management. On behalf of UC Davis, I would like to also extend our appreciation to the Financial Times and their staff who helped make Biz Quiz possible. Competitors, the preparation required for this challenge is an early indicator of your commitment to a lifetime of continued intellectual development, proclivity towards awareness of the world around you and the ability to form positive habits. You were tasked with reading 40 articles per day across 10 Financial Times columns and newsletters. Do, making some customers there, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and tomorrow you'll be tested on your knowledge of the global economy, socially responsible business, market trends, energy, and more. We hope you enjoy the competition and the friendly rivalry among the schools. Good luck to all of you. Now it's my honor to introduce Jenny Johnson President and Chief Executive Officer of Franklin Templeton. With a career at Franklin Templeton spanning more than 30 years, she has been a key driver in the company's transformation to what is now one of the most respected global firms focused on investment management, technology, innovation, diversity, and corporate social responsibility. Ms. Johnson joined the firm in 1988 and held leadership roles in all major divisions of the business before becoming CEO in February of 2020. She led the historic acquisition of Leg Mason in 2020, with the combined organization managing over $1.5 trillion in assets globally. She has been named among Barron's list of the 100 most influential women in U.S. finance for three consecutive years, most recently this year in 2022. She was also named on Forbes 2022 list of 50 over 50, highlighting women across industries with impressive achievements. Ms. Johnson serves on a variety of boards aligned with her professional and personal interests. She's a member of the International Advisory Panel of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and a member of the Board of Directors at Catalyst. We're especially proud to call Ms. Johnson one of our own. She earned her BA in economics here at UC Davis. You can applaud that. Yeah. <laughs> so, go eggs. Uh, now, I also have the pleasure of introducing tonight's interviewer, Peter Spiegel, U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times. Mr. Spiegel oversees the media group's editorial operations in the U.S. and the Americas from the, its regional headquarters in New York. He assumed the position in April of 2019 after spending three years as a news editor in London. There, he oversaw the Financial Times daily news operation, both in print and online. During his tenure as news editor, the Financial Times won 13 British Press Awards, the UK's highest journalism prize. The awards included News Website of the Year in 2017 and Newspaper of the Year in 2018. It was only the second time the Financial Times secured British journalism's highest honor in its 130-year history. From 2010 to 2016, Mr. Spiegel served as chief of the Financial Times Brussels Bureau. Prior to joining the Financial Times, he was Pentagon correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, after which he joined the Wall Street Journal, covering foreign policy and national security issues from its Washington Bureau. Mr. Spiegel earned a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's of science in European politics from the London School of Economics and, and Political Science. <laughs> We, we can't all be perfect, Peter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jenny Johnson and Peter Spiegel. Thank you.
Thank you, Chancellor May. I was getting a little bit worried when they were the, doing the two introductions that uh, when Jenny's list was getting read out, I'm like, boy, I'm going to pale in comparison here. But uh, it's very, it's a great pleasure. It's great to that you get to write your own intro. Uh, it does help. It does help. Uh, Chancellor May, uh, Dean Rao, before I get started, I just want to thank uh, the, the UC Davis for including the Financial Times in this event. Um, we are relatively new as a, as a competitor here in the U.S. to our domestic U.S. Uh, uh, business news organizations. But part of the reason we want to be here is we feel the UC system, and particularly the business students at the UC system, is a place that we think we have a future readership. And so we're really, really pleased to be participating in this event. Jenny, um, so as the chancellor said, you run an asset manager with $1.5 trillion uh, dollars under, under AUM, assets under management. I, I did a little bit of research before I got here. That is about the GDP of Mexico. <laughs> um, so rather sizable, it is the, of the publicly traded uh, asset managers, I believe you are the second largest in the world uh, to BlackRock. So just to give sense to the audience of how big Franklin Templeton is. Let me talk, just, just start about sort of the basic question about how you got to your current position. And if you wouldn't mind, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, as Chancellor mentioned, your position as a leading woman in finance. Because again, this is not scientific, but in my own head, I think about Abigail Johnson at, at, at Fidelity, you now have Jane Frazier at, at Citibank. You have Jenny Johnson at Franklin Templeton. And that's kind of it when you think about the senior reaches, the CEOs of the big financial services institutions, which is kind of, um, I guess, odd in the current environment when you think about GM and uh, so many of the other big American companies that are actually a little bit more diverse in terms of having women at the head. Do you think finance? Is, uh, is a little bit behind the curve on this? And, and tell me a little bit of what it's like to be one of the few sort of senior women in an industry that is still pretty much dominated by men. Well, first of all, I want to thank UC Davis for having me back. I had some of my best years of my life <laughs> here. <laughs> and uh, I was going to make another, and then I just pulled it back. Being <laughs> we're, we're being broadcast. Oh, there, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so anyway, it's really, really wonderful to be here. And I am just happy that I don't have to answer the quiz questions tomorrow. <laughs> Me too. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, it's funny. I remember somebody asked me the question. Um, uh, it was a, a young woman who had started in our kind of out of college program. And she said, what do you do when you walk in a room and you know that the men in the room are going to discount what you say? And I said, I've actually never walked into the room and thought that. Hmm. And by the way, you should never think that yourself. What, we all have insecurities, hmm. right? But the minute that's taking your mind share, it's taking your mind away from actually showing up in, in all yourself. And so I don't know whether, um, you know, I grew up in a family of, of seven kids. I, I was number six, I had brothers older than me, and I was always very competitive. Um, but I, it, it isn't something I think about that hmm. often. Um, and there are definitely times where in my career, I would be sitting across from somebody and a male who would talk to either one of my colleagues. I mean, you, you have that happen. But in the end, what I found is when you, over time, as you start to add value, people sort of forget mm. their bias. Mm. So I, I just don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Do you, I mean, do you dispute necessarily the premise of my question though? Do you think that financial services for some reason remains one of these bastions where it's harder for women to, get to positions of leadership than it is in some other American companies? Well, I'll, I'll give you a, a personal experience. Um, when I was being considered for CEO and the board was, you know, I was put through a kind of a, uh, um, you know, evaluation of CEOs internally and externally and did these various tests and various things. And, um, and one of the things I came out with exceptional, exceptional followership within my firm, mm. All right? So you have that data point. Fast forward a couple of months, and we were going to do this acquisition of Leg Mason, which was going to double the size of a firm. And boards do not like to change CEOs when there's an acquisition. And so the board was getting a little bit nervous about that. And, and one of them asked me, um, how do you feel about being the CEO of this combined company? And I said, well, I think it's a very difficult time in the asset management I industry, but I am incredibly excited about uh, and motivated to be the CEO of the combined company. So I left and I have a really good relationship with my CFO and he's like, good answer, that was really <laughs> strong. And then I get a phone call and I am, am told that I've created a divide in the board because the women liked my answer but several of the men felt that I wasn't a team player uh. because I didn't mention the men that I would be working with too. 
And, and so I, none of them were doing it intentionally. There, I think there was just a, a natural sort of, we all have biases, and there was a natural bias in it. And so I do think that the industry is trying to improve. Um, and, you know, but, but part of that is you have to recognize your biases as you, sh you know, mm -hmm. are evaluating things. And you also fundamentally have to believe in diversity. Look, we all prefer to talk to people who agree with us. I mean, it's one of the, I think, problems with the news today. You know, people listen to the, the news that, that, that agrees with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more of opinion often. Um, but if you really believe that, that you want the best outcomes, you need to have diversity show up in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're getting better as an industry in training and, and, and trying to change the narrative and, and how we attract people and recruit people and focus on retaining people. So I think we will change. But well, that was going to be my last question on this topic is, is do you see evidence in the, the next level down? I mean, I think, I think Jamie Dimon in, in recent promotions, when there's always the, the, the name game in, in, in New York about who's going to replace Jamie, there's now two women in positions there, Morgan Stanley less so. But I, do you see that changing in that sort of the, the next generation of leaders so that we could have a step change No, I, I d definitely do. Yeah. I, yes. Okay. Fair enough. Let me, let me talk, because you mentioned the Leg Mason acquisition, and, and I want to sort of follow up on that, because you, you have, almost uniquely, talk a bit about your, your strategy here. Franklin Templeton has been a very big participant in M&A, um, and you've got a lot of growth from M&A. There is a bit of a, a mantra in financial services that it is very difficult to integrate some M&A, and, and we have a lot of evidence of that. I mean, JP Morgan had evidence of that where there's infighting with old divisions and whatnot, but you've really sort of been very aggressive in that area. Tell me a little bit about why you've looked at growth through acquisition and what, what, what challenges that present as well. Well, I think um, part of it is that there's some fundamental shifts going on in the, in the capital markets. And one of them I think is a, a genuine concern, which is companies are choosing to not go public as long mm. as they can. So let's just think about that. If you, I, I, my grandfather, you know, uh, my grandfather actually founded Franklin Templeton, Franklin. Uh, and when he got into the business, it was because the average person couldn't participate in the returns in the equity market. And so people came up with this idea of, of you know, a mutual fund where you could get a diversified portfolio for, you know, very reasonable price. And that allowed everybody to participate. And, and you want that participation in the capital markets. The problem is today, in 2000, granted that was a bit of an anomaly time, the average company went public after three years. 2019, that was nine to 10 years. It's now 14 and 15 years. There are half the number of public companies and there are something like eight times the number of private equity backed companies. But that means the average investor can't participate in that. And so, number one, we had to look at our own portfolio and say, all right, there's just a natural, obvious part of the investment universe that we have to have uh, you know, a, a products to be able to offer our clients. And so several of our acquisitions, we're now the seventh largest uh, alternatives manager, we're buying alternatives managers. So private credit, uh, secondary private equity, real estate. Uh, and, and so we had to fill that gap because you look at this trend and you have to address it. Now, we are also very focused on trying to figure out responsible ways to bring those illiquid assets to the average investor. Mm. And the returns are staggeringly different in the private equity versus the, the public equity markets. And so we have to do that. Mm. Um, so it was really about filling product gaps. And then the, the question on, on um, acquisitions, like we have always had the view, the investment banker is gonna tell you, here's why it's a great deal, here's why it's a great strategic fit. They never talk about culture. To me, deals either succeed or not based on whether it's a cultural fit. Yeah. So we spend a lot of time with the teams, really trying to understand what the motivation is, what drives them, and to get a feel for whether there's a cultural fit. And we have passed up on more deal deals than we've actually acquired mm -hmm. because we felt like this is not gonna be good for the firm. Because it, it, if, if it's a, not a good cultural fit, it actually creates almost a cancer in the rest of the organization. Um, and then I think the benefit is we are really good about understanding in the asset management business, you are buying talent and their investment process. So don't go mess with it, right? Mm -hmm. So leave that alone, mm -hmm. create an environment where they have more resources and 
can, um, you know, have, it, really one plus one equals three. We're there, you know, for example, I'm a big believer that data is gonna be very significant uh, for uh, active managers where you get unique sources of insights and data. So we've created this, this central investment data lake um, where anybody, any of our 18 investment teams can use it or not use it, but it's a value add. Mm -hmm. Being able to have, when, when uh, COVID hit, you had US Treasuries, the, the most liquid asset class in the world frees up. We were able to pull together senior macro uh, investors from multiple different teams getting together and being able to talk about their perspective. One, one person, Western, was actually talking to the Treasury about what was going on. We had a private credit. And they found the value of being able to talk really comfortably and confidentially with people inside the firm. And so, you know, it's, you know, it's early days, but so far it's yeah. going okay. So let me, let me push you a little bit on the alternative assets, because that the most acquisition, recent acquisition you announced, which I think was at your earnings on Monday, was a European alternative asset manager as well. And just again, so we don't use too much jargon, I mean, the only thing we're meaning by alternate is sort of not your traditional stocks and bonds that are traded in the public market, real estate, private equity, private, private credit. Um, to play as the devil's advocate here, there is a, a sense, in the, I think, in the industry that the publicly traded assets um, in terms of the fees you can charge with the, with the, with the emergence of ETFs and, and um, it, it, is, it is less, it's easier to charge higher fees with alternative assets than publicly traded assets because they become a bit commoditized. So that while some have looked at your strategy and say, okay, she's making a smart bet because so much of, the, of these companies are staying private, private for a long time, she's also making a smart bet because let's be honest, her fee structure is gonna be, it's gonna be easier to be more profitable in these assets. Is that a, a fair assessment of your strategy? It, Sure, you okay. know, uh, but, but, but I think it's really important to understand the top quartile performing private equity generated 20% return a year above the bottom quartile. Mm -hmm. The top performing real estate managers, 10% a year, and the top performing private credit, 5% a year over the bottom. So they're able to charge those fees and, and they're, because they're oversubscribed, because they're providing value. And so as long as you have managers that are excellent managers, and we mm -hmm. feel like we've acquired excellent managers, you're, you're, gonna, have, you're gonna be able to re, you know, attain that kind of fee structure. The bottom guys are the ones that are on sale, which is my worry for, you know, there's such a focus on fees in the, in the wealth channel and 401k, you know, first thing people will talk about is fees, that who's gonna be on sale? It's gonna be the bottom quartile performing mm -hmm. private managers, and you're better off being in the public markets than you are with a bottom performing manager. Let me ask you another thing about this strategy, which, which again, this is perhaps people on the critical end of, of, of your strategy would say, Yes, of course, it's true. We've seen 10, 15 years, maybe, of you know, the ability of private companies, Uber, pick, pick your next to raise money in the private markets. But it's been the biggest boom time in modern history, 0% interest rates, easy to raise private capital. We're about to head into probably something else, um, you know, whether it's deep recession or mild recession or soft landing. It is obviously a higher interest rate environment where perhaps the assumption you've made about alternative assets will be different going forward. How concerned are you that as you move into a, whatever we're, what's happening in 2023 with a, with, a, with a tougher economy, that those pools of private capital are not gonna be there the way they were over the last 10 years? So I actually, you know, we went into these acquisitions really looking and saying, look, you know, at some point there's gonna be a hangover to this party. Um, and, you know, the, I, I think the good news is um, the real estate manager that we bought, Clarion Partners, is very big in the industrial real estate space. So warehouse storage, those types of things. Yeah. And so as you look at e-commerce, that's been a real boom for them. Uh, the, the residential housing has been very much underbuilt in the U.S., so there's probably pretty good solid rents, even with some increase uh, in interest rates. Uh, private credit tends to be 80 to 90 percent variable, so as long as you have good underwriting standards. And what's been proven, while a little bit counterintuitive, uh, is that covenant light, yeah. meaning you have less restrictions in the loan deal, you have a little bit more flexibility as a lender, have actually performed better because they can work with the companies on the mm -hmm. workout. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're gonna be able to, provided you had good underwriting and, and you know, good cash flow companies, they should be able to, to handle the, um, you know, the rising rates. And then we did secondary private equity. There's been $6 trillion that has been deployed in private equity. There's been about 110 billion deployed in secondary, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, and then about 140 billion raised. 
So if you think about it, you're a pension fund, you've had the market drop, say, 22%. You still have to have outflows of cash. Your ATM is your public you know, credit and your public equity, so you're pulling from that pool. You are suddenly way over allocated in your alternatives, and a lot of them have the investment mandates that don't permit mm -hmm. them to be above a certain amount. So they end up calling up a secondary private equity manager like we have Lexington Partners, and this is a real transaction. One of the states said, I need a billion dollars out of this portfolio in 30 days. So they go in and they cherry pick which managers and which vintage that they want, mm -hmm. and they can do it based on what they think the current marks are from pricing as well as interest rates. So I think that um, for a variety of reasons, like long-term capital has benefits to, to deal with cycles, so the alternatives have that as well. Um, but I think in, in our case, we feel very good about the space that we're playing in. One last thing on, on alternatives, because th there is an argument, well, I don't want to say this argument, I'll say I, I have the, the worry as, as a financial journalist, because we always get bashed over the head when there's a, a financial crisis. Why didn't you warn us about this? Why didn't you warn us about this? Um, we, we are, and, and we frequently don't see it coming, um, but 2008, uh, the great SPACs, financial crisis. SPACs, did you see that coming? SPACs, we wrote a lot about SPACs. Um, um, the 2010 uh, Eurozone crisis, almost every major financial crisis is preceded by a lot of leverage, yeah. over leverage. Yes. 2008 was the housing market, 2010 and the Eurozone crisis was sovereign debt. We are now at a point where we're the, we're the most debt on the books globally, both sovereign and, and private in the history of mankind. As a financial journalist who has been bashed over the head now twice for missing um, a credit bubble somewhere, I try to get my guys and women to try to find out where that bubble is. The issue of covenant light and private credit comes up frequently. So just to, again, to jargonize slightly, post-financial crisis, the traditional banking sector was very heavily regulated, basically saying, stop giving away bad loans, right? Stop doing it, you're, you're, you're a, almost a public utility. A lot of those lending went into the private market. So a private equity firm, which used to do buyouts, stuff like that, made arms, Blackstone, some others, that now did lended, lend money to, to companies. Um, it's been covenant light, which means there's not a whole lot of collateral to some of these things. They've been done during COVID and during a lot of 0% interest rates and a lot of cheap and easy lending. That's an area that gets me a little bit nervous because if I'm looking for an area where there is over leverage that may, may have pockets of very high bubbly risk, that seems to be a place that we should be focusing on. Tell me why you're not worried about that. Well, well first of all, I think that if you're looking for where the leverage is, it's in the government's balance sheets right now. That's so that's where true. the shift That's went. very true, yeah. Um, you know, the consumer is, uh, a, 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 particularly the U.S. consumer, has his, you know, less debt now than they had pre-COVID. Um, you, you know, delinquencies are at all-time low with a slight uptick, but nothing, I mean, minor, minor uptick. They have a, a fair bit in their checking accounts. So the consumer's pretty dang strong and doesn't mm. have a lot of debt. Corporations are still pretty good. Uh, you know, they're not carrying a huge amount of debt. Um, to the extent that they did, they borrowed low and, and oftentimes had a fixed rate because they knew that they, this was kind of an opportunity that was going up. So I actually think that we're going into this period with the consumer and corporations in pretty good shape. I think it's the governments that, mm. that are mm. in the tougher position. You don't see, again, part of my concern, I guess, is that we've spent the last decade with almost free money and now we're in a rising interest rate environment where, boy, you know, given what Powell said this week, who knows where it's ending. And some of those people who may have had fixed are at some point gonna have to refinance at not zero, maybe five, maybe seven, maybe eight. Are you at all worried that we, there are companies that have over leverage that we don't see it now that are going to be blowing up sometime in the next 12, 18 months? Oh, so a couple of things. So the good news on the consumer is that in, in the, financial crisis, about 40% of mortgages were variable. Now that number's like seven or 8%. Mm. So it's really the bigger problem is people going to buy housing now. Um, but I, look, I, I think that, you know, we're, we're in for a tough ride here. Mm. Um, if you're an active manager, that's a good thing because we get to pick, you know, yeah. uh, where to make investments. I think that, you know, the companies that 
haven't had profitability, there are a lot of companies that have big valuations that weren't profitable, um, you know, are going to have a hard time in this period of time. It's going to be hard for them to continue to, uh, to borrow. Uh, but good cash flowing companies, uh, you, you know, you're only now, even though the market's down 20, whatever it is, 22%, you're only now starting to see earnings actually be reforecasted yeah. down. Yeah. I mean, you hadn't even seen that yet. Yeah. It was really just multiples coming down. Um, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a time where any time, so I, I, I describe to people, because this is my argument on passive versus active management. Yeah. You know, if I said to you go buy a car and get the cheapest car you can get to get safely from point A to point B, and you're just driving down a well-paved straight road, you're gonna get a car with no safety features, right? But if you gotta go up to Tahoe and you hit a snowstorm, you're gonna wish you'd paid up for those safety features. And the problem is we had a decade of absolute driving straight on a well-paved road. This is a great analogy. Was, I love this analogy. But everybody yeah. was brilliant, right? Everybody was a brilliant investor <laughs> yeah. because everything Everything's went up. Because yeah. where were you going to put it? Yeah. But now we're in that, and um, you know, I, I, I do think we're going to. It, it matters hmm. who you're picking, and that's and really picking interesting. The winners. That's a really good way of putting it. That's a really good point. Let me completely change the subject. We could probably nerd out on this uh, for a while, but we obviously have here in the audience uh, a lot of, of, of soon-to-be MBAs who are uh, going to work, join the workforce, and I think. Even before COVID, there was a something of a generational shift about expectations of people uh, who coming into the financial services industry. We saw during COVID, Goldman, um, amongst others, where the, so the junior bankers were revolting at the amount of hours they're working. Um, the Morgan Stanley was calling people back to the office. People didn't want to go back to the office. Just curious how you manage now talent, particularly young talent coming in, because expectations are very different about hybrid work about um, you know, the hours put in by, by young, by young bank, by people in the, in the industry. Um, talk a little bit about whether you've been forced to change your thinking about how you, how you deal with new hires and, and talent. So uh, let me talk about, uh, let me address that in kind of this hybrid return to work, work in the office sort of, because I, I gotta tell you, I don't know the answer to it. Mm. The only thing I know for sure is that whatever we think it is right now, it's not gonna be. Mm. Um, I ran our technology department, and at that time we had people in, we had about uh, offices in, in about 35 countries, over 100 offices, and so pretty quickly I was thinking, we need to be able to see people. If you're talking to people, it's hard enough doing meetings where you're talking to people, but if they're different culture, English is a second language, you really need the verbal, and so, mm -hmm. I mean the visual. So we had these um, you know, video conferencing when it was a separate device on your desk, right? So at Franklin Templeton, it became part of our culture where almost somebody was always on video. COVID just accelerated it and got the naysayers who didn't believe it could happen actually believe. Problem is, what, what today, number one, I know that if somebody commutes and they sit in their cubicle and they don't interact with others, they're gonna resent the company for wasting their time. They could be with family, they could be working out, they could be doing all these other things. So presence with a purpose is really important. And that means that it shifts to the leaders to make it mm. valuable when you come into the office. So that's one. Um, I did just learn, because so I said, so we should you know, do some free lunches and things. And then they're like, yeah, they come in for the free lunch and then they leave. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but you want to have the, the cultural um, interaction. Uh, so it's, we're, we're trying to do this two days a week, but investment teams get to choose whatever, the, you know, some, some investment teams say, I have everybody on the same desk, they have to come in five days a mm -hmm. week or four days a week. Um, and others are, you know, more comfortable being flexible. I think we're all gonna learn this, mm -hmm. learn about it. I just came from, um, with, uh, 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 you know, uh, JP Morgan Chase and Jamie Dimon was talking and he really believes everybody should be back in. And, and there is value to it and I think there's a feeling that if you have layoffs and, and things that suddenly everybody's gonna be back in the office. I feel like that misses it a little bit. I do feel like we have to, you know, you, you live in New York, some people commute an hour and a half each way, yeah. three hours a day, yeah. right? So you gotta make it really valuable, but we also have to understand it's an opportunity for mentorship and others, and so there's gotta be some balance that works. Well, it's interesting, you mentioned the issue of corporate culture, which, which I must say just even my, in my own newsroom, being able to pass on the values of what it is to be a Financial Times journalist 
how do you do that when people are not actually in the newsroom? But I, it would strike me that, that your industry is even more problematic in that there are regulatory issues, you know, the SEC going after a lot of financial services firms for people using WhatsApp and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that there are regulatory requirements that for fiduciary reasons, you actually, being in the office is somewhat legally, or outside the office is legally uh, at risk. Is that also on your mind when you think about hybrid work and how you, how you data breaches and all this kind of stuff? I mean, is, is the legal regulatory issue hanging over your head or it sounds like it's more of a cultural thing that you I think it's about? more culture. I think the legal, look at, you know, I mean, the WhatsApp issue is a big, right? So there's another technology that you put on your phone and yeah. you, you, you solve it. So you solve those things as mm. they kind of come about. But um, I, so I don't worry so much about that. I worry just from a cultural standpoint, making sure that people feel connected to the firm. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think we have a lot of data. I did hear from uh, one firm that they found that w the senior people were coming in and the junior people were coming in. It was the middle managers who weren't. But where they looked at the middle managers that weren't coming in, they had higher turnover on their teams, uh, right? Yes. So there's something, you know. Yes, so, you're less wedded to the. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's important that people feel connected. I say, I am passionate about what we do every day. We help people solve them. The, you know, the, the biggest problems in their lives or the, you know, help them achieve the milestones in their lives. I want people to feel mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. mission. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you're disconnected from the office, I don't know that you always get it. But yeah. I, I also don't think you have to be in five days a week to get it either. My executive team, because it's made up of members of various acquisitions, we're not co-located. Uh -huh. And so, you know, my choice was I forced everybody to co-locate and that meant that I was going to lose some of this mm -hmm. really great talent. Uh, and so we've committed to one week a quarter. It's really more like three days a quarter where we get together. We do three nights of dinner, two days of planning, uh, and that's our time mm -hmm. to spend together. The reality is most executives in a firm, you're traveling and you don't coordinate. So you're actually not all together anyway. So this way yeah. it forces us to be together. We're going to play that out and see how it goes. And if that doesn't work, we'll adjust. Let me ask you the, the question the other way around, which is, as you mentioned, you know, Jamie Dimon has said this, uh, James Gorman at Morgan mm -hmm. Stanley, they've been pretty doctrinaire on everyone get back to the office and maybe a New York thing versus a West Coast thing. Do you find that actually in recruiting talent that you actually may be uh, have a, a strategic advantage in that you're, you're being a bit more thoughtful, you know, flexible in this, that actually find the best talent, you're finding that maybe they want to work from home for two, three days, and that actually is an advantage to you from, from attracting talent. I mean, talent. that's the hypothesis, right? Yeah. Which is um, that you can, you know, what I've said is, <laughs> you know, the war for talent's over, talent won. You're going to have to move. <laughs> you're going to have to move and, and recruit talent wherever talent wants to be. I remember sitting there and doing a, um, a team's call, and it was our digital asset team. And I was laughing because they were literally all over the world. And they had sort of found each other and, um, and have done some pretty interesting things. So it can happen. I think the leadership of a group has to do a good job with it. Um, and again, we're, we're all going to be learning. You know. My youngest son would come home from school and he would be on, uh, you know, gaming with his buddies. Their social time yeah. was really interacting via this gaming, <laughs> right? Like he wasn't hanging out. They, he would do sports or whatever, but they, they've gotten more comfortable with that. And I go up against my son. I'm like, who are you talking to? Like, yeah, yeah. I got the headset on. I'm like, uh, um, I, I got a few questions um, from the audience here that, that would pass on to me before we got on stage. Let me ask you a couple of them. I mean, a lot of them are very uh, asking for investment advice, I think. But, uh, <laughs> you don't uh, want it from me. <laughs> I just managed the 1,800 investment people we have. Let me ask the big macro sort of markets in 2023, but also your view maybe on what we were talking about is is there is a lot of doom and gloom uh, you know the uh, elliot management recently coming out and saying there's going to be you know blood in the streets and stuff like that what is your view on 2023 in terms of are we headed for a really bad recession is it a, is it a shallow recession is it a soft landing but also you know as you look at the markets are there are there safe havens that your portfolio managers think that uh, are the right places to be when you're heading into turbulent waters so First of all, again, the consumer still is really strong and still spending. Mm, mm. I, I just listened to the CEO of United Airlines is like, hey, hybrid work is the greatest thing for us. Mm. Guess what? The weekend's four days. We see you know, travel <laughs> all the time, right? Uh, he goes, oh, business class travel is not up for businesses. It's up for the consumer. So the consumer is still very resilient um, and, and, and are going into this with low debt. Um, you know. And, and we see it with core inflation, that the, people are still going out 
to dinner, that's still going up. I think core inflation is going to be stickier than probably people mm. think. Mm. Um, and you why, know, do you, why do you think that is? Is it because, the energy or is it? Because I think the consumer still has money to ah, spend. Ah, okay. uh, and, and you know, you listen to uh, Jamie Dimon literally said there's $1.5 trillion more in U.S. bank accounts than there were pre-COVID, yeah. right? I mean, they still have more money. Uh, inflation's gonna take away a percentage of that, but they still have it. So I think that mutes the depth of the recession. I think you probably, the Fed almost has to get you into something that slows yeah. down. Um, but I don't know that we have blood in the streets in the, in, the, in the same way. I mean, you mentioned, again, to slightly nerd out on this, that the, the Fed could push us into this. I mean, the, the interesting messaging this week was, originally we thought it was over. Yeah, I was gonna say, what was the messaging? Uh, yeah, well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. We thought for a while that they were gonna pause, but then he's like, well, we might have to go higher than we thought we were gonna be. I've been talking to some of the, the faculty here at Davis uh, today. That was their biggest concern was the Fed is is going to overreact and is already talking about five, five and a half percent. That's what's been priced in. Um, is that is that a worry of yours that 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 we could be headed to a place where to regain its credibility, the Fed really has to crush things and that's the the, the risk out there? I mean, I do think because in the '70s they they pull back and that you know, you know know that story. Um, I think that the Fed is concerned about that. They also recognize that they're a lagging. It takes time for yeah. when these rates, when they raise rates for it to really impact the economy. Uh, and so, you know, they're trying to be data driven. I, you know, I, I think our, look, we have four very independent fixed income teams and they vary on their views. Mm. Um, <laughs> so, I, that, which is always a problem for me because there's not a house view. So yeah. I have to pick, it's like picking a child who I'll <laughs> say. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I think my instinct is it's probably you got another 50 basis points and then maybe they do 25, 25 or 150 and then they sit on mm, it to mm. see what ultimately happens. Um, we do start to see and there was some conversation from the bankers that the sort of the subprime, they're starting to see that community deteriorate. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the first to go because yeah. they're really living paycheck to paycheck. So. Um, you know, but we also have this labor participation rate. You know, you, you, you can't, I don't know if you guys know anybody who has a restaurant who actually is, has a full staff, I mean, or hotels. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you do hope that there's opportunity for people if, if they're starting to get to the point where they are concerned about being able to meet their expenses that they can actually, you know, come back into the labor force. Uh, and I think all that counts is a bit of a cushion mm -hmm. for this. Well, last question on this, if we take your, you know, they do 50 points in, in December and then another 25, 25, and they sit and wait. If you were an economist sitting on the, um, advising the Fed, do you think that's, are you happy with that scenario or? or, or? So I think that's okay. And yeah. then, and what, what it's, you asked the question about where to go. Well, you learn in bear markets, you're reminded that 40% of total return in equity markets, it comes from dividends. This is a really good time yes. to get dividend paying stocks yeah. that are gonna let you get paid while you're sitting and yeah. waiting. Yeah. And this again, you're gonna look at, you know, uh, free cash flow companies that have good, you know, good earnings. Like this is a good time to sort of sit in those and be yeah. more conservative in it. Um, I'm almost afraid to bring up this topic given our discussion <laughs> at dinner. I know where but it's going. One of the one of the the other market related question was crypto. Um, you have very strong views in this, but can I ask you to talk about your crypto, but also I think the most interesting bit of our conversation at dinner was um, your pivot discussion about the blockchain, which you think is potentially transformational to the financial services industry. So talk, talk a bit about your views on cryptocurrencies, but I would, if you could talk more broadly about blockchain and how that could disintermediate a lot of what exists currently in the financial services. Yes, yeah, so what I say is Bitcoin is the greatest distraction from what I think is the greatest disruption to financial services, which is blockchain and the technology and what it's gonna do. Um, and it is amazing to me how many conversations end up down, you start in this digital assets and you end up right into a debate about Bitcoin. That's a debate like art. You either love it or you hate it. <laughs> um, but blockchain, if, essentially the technology takes out the frictional cost of transactions. So if you can reduce the frictional cost of transactions, then you can have a lot more interesting creativity um, that comes. And I think it's important from equity markets because I actually think there's sort of a new dynamic that's being created here. Um, I'll, I'll, first thing is I think actually back offices will become much more efficient, will be just cheaper to do what we do today. So that's a given. But then the more interesting thing is the kind of assets that get unlocked in this space. And we were talking and I said, you know, Web 2.0 
brought things like Uber and Airbnb where you could monetize big assets that you had. Uh, and the technology of the internet allowed you to monetize that. Blockchain is gonna allow you to monetize other assets that are even smaller. So there's a company, um, Helium, that is a two-year waiting list where you basically use their hardware router and they pay you in coins, and whatever, I don't know if they're Ethereum or whatever their coins are, uh, to use your excess capacity in your router, right? So suddenly you've turned that into a, a revenue stream for you. Uh, there's a company called Tether TV where you, they wanna be the fastest streaming service. And when you're watching, you're allowing them to cash on your device. And so if Peter wants to watch it, it just has to jump from my device to his device. They pay me in an Ethereum coin. Uh, and so I'm now a client I'm kind of like an equity owner because as the network gets bigger, I'm getting paid to that, do that. And I'm actually part of their IT infrastructure department. They can go hire, you know, buy less AWS because their clients are all part of their cloud servicing. So the technology is simply creating that. And then there's actually a third category. And so that's where I say that becomes interesting to equity markets. I'll give you one more example. So Google, you search on Google, they get 100% of your economic value. There's a company, really poorly executed, but somebody will do it right, where when you search, they're gonna pay you in coins, so you're gonna capture some percentage of that equity value. If they had pretty good search capability, do you think you'd change your behavior and get paid to do your search on their site? Probably. So that's where I think traditional uh, firms start to mm. get challenged by this. And then the final thing is there's whole new categories that are gonna be interesting, um, things like, um, uh, you know, the NFTs, if you think about intellectual capital, intellectual property, uh, you'll be able to monetize those. So the first NFTs came out and we all wondered why you wanted, you know, the ape or whatever. But um, there's a company in our incubator that helps artists ca capture more of the economics as they, um, so today you paint a painting, you get about a third of your initial sale and that's it. So now they tie an NFT to that painting. I sell you, so somebody sells me the painting, I sell it to you, you know it's an authentic, mm -hmm. right? So that's good, yeah. you feel good. The smart contract in that NFT ensures that the original artist gets a percentage and it's paid directly out of that. Uh, and, um, and then that original artist can actually do a loyalty program, can invite everybody who owns their paintings and, and do a Zoom cocktail party. So there's kind of interesting new, um, I think business cases that, or business ideas that come out of that. Louis Vuitton has an NFT tied to their purses. So, you know, one of the problems these guys have is that they're, um, you know, the fake ones are all created. Well, you can prove that it's an original by, by validating the NFT. Yeah. So, you know, kind of this, um, uh, uh, physical and, and digital world coming together. And then the same thing is artists, you know, who own, I think the state of Florida owns Bob Marley's, uh, you know, uh, all his uh, music. That's well, yeah. think about how, how do you monetize that yeah. today, right? Well, maybe there's probably going to be ways that actually I know there are, because I know there's companies that are creating that are gonna help you monetize so that you can actually collect if you have that ownership. So the world you're describing is basically a world in which, for lack of a better, lack of, lack of a better word, gatekeepers or even rent seekers that, 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 that used to exist traditionally are now disintermediated. So I can have a direct relationship. I'm just trying to think intellectually what companies, what financial services firms, what kind would be most affected by this? Is it sort of the, I now trade on Wall Street and Ken Griffin gets a little bit of a vig for everything I, I trade on. Is it that kind of disintermediation? Or is it, I have a retail bank account at Chase, why would I have my money in a bank account? Just tell me a little bit about, about who are the losers here. What, what are the traditional institutions that are really gonna struggle if I no longer need that middleman there? Well, I definitely think those who are validating like a title company, yeah. right? Because title you can have the title embedded in the smart contract. Um, I do think they're actually, going to be new um, new derivative products that are created, you know, where you'll be able to do lending like on a spot, like collateral lending that's inner day. You know, today mm -hmm. you fill out a bunch of paperwork, you have ISDAs yeah. and various things. Like that stuff's all gonna be built into the smart contract. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think you're gonna um, increase the types of, of uh, investments you can make. Um, you know, lending today, there are companies that, that lend on blockchain where you, you still have to go market to the individual, um, but you, you probably, from a KYC standpoint, 
uh, you'll be able to validate better. Uh, and, and once you're actually, there's a company that is trying to you create your own identity. So ideally, if I have a coin and a token and it's, I'm validated through KYC and it has a bunch of my own personal information, one is when I go open an account, I just have to show you the token and you know that this token is legit, it's yeah. me, done, the KYC's done. But also where I could start to sell my preferences. So instead of Google capturing that, there'll be people who come to me and say, okay, you're a female CEO, you know, what do you, what do you like here? And I can choose to, to sell some mm. of my preferences mm. and my information on there. Mm. So it'll bring it back to That's us individually. That's very interesting. Um, last point on this, um, because I know it's going to be a topic that if I don't ask it, um, I'll get criticized for it. But the first bit of your answer was that Bitcoin is a distraction. Talk to me a little bit about what you mean by that, because I think there is a lot of people, I mean, you, you mentioned this in almost every conversation you have about this, comes down to what do you think about Bitcoin? I mean, just, what's, what's, so, your, what's your view on that? So, look, I, I think, I, I used to say Bitcoin's going to be worth zero because government, first of all, governments will never give up the control of their currency. I mean, that is the, one of the issues with the euro, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. Germany should have an appreciated yeah. currency, Greece should have a depreciated one. Um, so they'll never, and, and then you'll see, you know, look at China already has, has banned it. So if it ever got so big, so I used to say, oh, there's gonna be no place. But then I talked to somebody who said, hey, my parents and grandparents who live in Israel had government take away all of their wealth. Mm. They will, it's that fear, right? They will always allocate a percentage to Bitcoin because they know that it mm. is protected. It's mm. outside of kind yeah. of the, the establishment. And so I think there's probably some value to that. Um, but the problem is I never like investing in something that is more emotionally determined on value versus yeah. you know, true intrinsic value. And I think Bitcoin sort of falls in that category. Yep. Yeah, and, and very volatile because of that. Yeah. All right, let me close out. I got a couple questions here from the audience that are a little bit more, shall we say, touchy-feely. Um, um, what aspect of your job do you find most exciting, most interesting? Well, first of all, I absolutely love what I do, hmm. right? Like I, I, like, I get motivated every day. Like, I think about, you know, what are we doing? We're helping people. You know, you talk to somebody who, who um, you know, we're helping people achieve the most important things in their lives financial independence to know that they can retire with dignity. Like that, that matters. Mm. You have a special needs child and you worry about whether there'll be enough money when you're gone, mm. right? You, and giving them the right access to that is really important. And so, you know, I feel like the employees at Franklin Templeton, we really talk about take care of the client and the business takes care of itself. And that gets me fired up. I, I tell the story about how, um, I, so my, I have five children. My three daughters have um, careers of a hardworking mother, singer, actress, and documentary filmmaker. <laughs> and so when I ask them, uh, you know, would, are any of you going to follow me? My, one of my daughters said, oh, no, I want to do something that helps people. I'm like, <laughs> this is what we do every day. I feel like I'd failed it as, Thanks, as a honey. parent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so that, I love that. And I love the people I work with. And you know what? We, we have clients in 155 countries. And so um, to, to go to these places, meet people, start to understand different cultures. I got to tell you, the press mm. does, does a poor job of describing a lot of these places. Yeah, yeah. So, no. Um, so it's just fun to be able to, to do that. Uh, on that point, though, I'm just curious. I mean, this is a, a slight tangent, but I was at, um, actually it was Milken, I think, last year, and I was at, watched a panel on the democratization of finance. Um, Kathy Woods was on it, and it was all these kind of uh, sort of crypto champions and stuff like that. And, and the argument was that um, your average Joe in the street does not really have access to the capital markets, and therefore is falling behind on wealth, and therefore we have to democratize, we can't just... And, I worry slightly that if, if the, 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 the logical extension of that, that, of that argument is um, everyone should have their pension invested in the stock market. Um, maybe I don't have to pay you quite as much, so your salary doesn't have to pay. But, but you know, as long as you're invested in the stock market, and then you know, we're all, they're all, everyone uses it to, to invest in GameStop, and then suddenly everyone. So I guess I'm wondering if there's a, if there's a, a, a are you at all worried that this movement towards democratization is going to get more retail investors, and we sort of saw it with the, with the whole meme stock thing, retail investors piling into a market that they may not 100% understand. Now this is, I know from the Financial Times this sounds incredibly patronizing, but um, a, a institution like Franklin Templeton, I put my money with you and I know it, it, it's doing the right thing, but the, even the discussion that you're having about getting people to feel that they can help their, their 
a disabled child when they pass. It seems to me the narrative now is that your individual retail investor knows on their own what they should be doing and whether that's potentially going too far. So, I mean, I remember in 1997, Business Week had the cover of it was the death of the broker, right? Yeah. Right. It was because the internet was going to destroy. You know, the reality is most people, especially when you have bear markets like right now, um, appreciate advice. Mm. And it tends, about 20% of the people are truly do-it-yourselfers and about 80% preferred advice. And even, we have a, a high net worth business and we have many people who made their money in financial services and realize it's not a part-time job. By the way, I now have enough money to do other stuff. This isn't what I want to do, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that unfortunately the times where you have, like we've had, where you had this massive bull market where Stocks were highly correlated, mm. uh, and uh, you know companies that were were selling at unbelievable multiples that had no earnings made everybody a brilliant investor. Yeah, and then you get times like this, and people start to realize, wow, actually, th th Put it in. I, I need to really rethink about yeah. this, and I, I'd like to have it professionally managed. And you know, people ask me like, what's the one piece of advice? Diversify. Mm -hmm. Like you never know what is going to happen. You know. I, I, a lot of really smart people were absolutely certain there's no way that Putin was going to invade the Ukraine. Like, it mm. made no sense. Mm. And yet he did. Like, yeah. you, so you never know when that kind of black swan comes. And yeah. so you've got to have a diversified portfolio. So not to put words in your mouth, but I guess what you're saying is part of the reason that you're excited about your job is you feel you run a company that actually provides that kind of advice mm -hmm. as opposed to these 20 percent to yourselfers who are, are running the risk of, of getting cashed out when and some of them are great you know yeah. some of them do a great job i mean i i to be honest I, I was really worried like gamestop what a terrible thing like people are like we're gonna go get the hedge fund manager wait you're putting your savings because you want like he doesn't care mm. <laughs> there's so. always someone on the other side of the trade yeah yeah so it, it, you know but there's only so much you could do on that. <laughs> um, another slightly um, touchy-feely question, although very self-serving, I will say, but I'm going to pick it out anyway, given that tomorrow is the biz quiz. Um, the most surprising news story or the most interesting news story you've read recently? Oh, wow. Doesn't have to be the Financial Times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I, just, I, I can only flash back to, the, to uh, <laughs> something a few people sent me today, uh, which was on ethical gold ETFs, but... That's not that interesting. It just happened. <laughs> should I mess with that or should I not mess with it? You know, you not mentioned you mentioned the 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 Ukraine uh, war. Obviously, we've lived now through a pandemic as well. Um, you know, you you, you talk about um, diversifying risk. So maybe not a news story per se, but I'm just curious, having lived as an asset manager through the last two years, where these black swans have seemed to come repeatedly. Um, every hundred years, every three every, years. Yeah, 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 or even more quickly than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, is that, again, you know, you and I from a vantage of a sort of a similar age and a similar generation, you know, is it, does it feel like it's happening more quickly because we've become middle-aged? Or is it actually do you think these kind of black swan events are happening more quickly? And how do you, how do you run a company to take that into account? It sure feels like they're coming more often. Um, and I don't know whether that's technology that the world, you know, moved mm. towards globalization and... Um, you know, communication is faster. I'm not sure what it is, but it sure feels like that. Um, and you, you know what? You, you run a company by every day kind of addressing whatever's ahead of you and that you mm. can control. Um, I do think the number one most important thing is to keep your eye focused on the, the customer. Mm. What are the customer's mm. needs? If you can provide value to the customer, you're gonna have a business. And so listen to your customer. It sounds so cliche, it's amazing how many companies don't do it. Yeah, <laughs> but there's, there's another question here, so it's a good segue to, to sort of, you know, a portfolio manager in a recession. How do you, what, 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 what do you advise for a portfolio manager? But I'll, I'll broaden that slightly to, you know, being a portfolio manager in a, such an uncertain time. Now, you're not yourself a portfolio manager, but when you talk to portfolio managers, the ones that you really like and the ones you think are quite good, where do you see them managing risk? And how, how do the best ones manage that kind of risk? So the interesting thing, um, you know, I get this question about, you know, uh, What's it like managing portfolio managers and how do you think about it? And I say, you know, often you're sort of a therapist for the group that are under, that are out of favor. So just think if you were a value mm. manager for the last decade, right? Like people literally thought you were, got stupid overnight, 
right? You would, you would stick to, no, I'm looking for good solid companies with good cash flows. And you watch these uh, tech companies just skyrocketing and you were underperforming by 1200 basis points a year. I mean, these poor guys, guys and gals, uh, you know, just felt terrible. Uh, and so you'd say, look, your clients hire you to do this. They're mm -hmm. looking for a diversified portfolio. And now, of course, in this type of market, those guys are the heroes. Um, so I think the most important thing is that in any portfolio managers are saying, this is what you're really good at. Don't worry what they're good at. This is what you're good at and stay in your lane. Uh, and you know, clients are very clear they want to hire you to do something. Mm -hmm. You describe it and, and, and do that. All right. I'll finish up because we're, we're, we're about five minutes left. Um, one more, one last touchy feely one, and then I'll get back to something slightly more professional. Um, if you weren't in the investment manager business, <laughs> what you would, would you be doing for a living? I think I'd like to be a cowgirl. A cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> And why? <laughs> <laughs> Tell a quick side story. So I, I love riding, riding horses, and I, and I was not good at it. So in my 40s, I finally got a horse, and I realized I wasn't actually good at it. So I decided the only way I was going to be good is if I learned to ride bareback, which meant I kept falling off constantly. Anyway, I end up having a, a, a bad accident on my horse, and uh, I wake up, and I look at my neighbor, I'm in the emergency room, and, and I said, what happened? And she said, oh, you had a bad horse wreck, and she wouldn't look at me. And then I said, well, how is my horse Phoenix? Oh, Phoenix is fine. And I said, does that make me a cowgirl? And she's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, and she ignores me. And then I ask another question, and she turns and looks at me. I had asked that same question for oh, three no. questions for 30 minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> so apparently, I really want to be a yeah, cowgirl. Yeah. Then when you get hit in the head, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, um, back from the, the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, no, in all seriousness, um, one of the questions here, which I think is a good thing, again, for this audience and, and those listening at home uh, uh, online, just your basic, what kind of advice would you give to someone going into the uh, financial services industry? How do you succeed? I mean, are, is, are, there, are there rules of the road? Are there advice you can pass on, given your 30 years experience to, to a, a group of recent, soon-to-be MBA graduates? So I, I guess um, I think the you know financial services are really in, in my 30 plus years in this business I don't think I've felt the pressure for change like I feel now mm -hmm. like I think it is really evolving quickly I think banks are going to have a different role I think there's so you know look at all the private credit that's done consumer loans um, done directly so. It's a really interesting time, but it's also a great time to be in that. It's a great time if you're technically savvy. Mm. Um, so I would say, if you're interested in being it, I, the advice I give anybody going into it is, first of all, like read the annual report. Whatever the CEO letter is in the annual report is kind of what's on the CEO's mm. mind. So mm. if you're working for a company, you can sort of get a roadmap right there about what a CEO's thinking and figure out how you're relevant. Ask a lot of questions. Be your, and this for women in particular, uh, be your own advocate. Like nobody's really going to advocate for you, uh, and a, a good boss should, but you can't rely on that. So mm. be your own advocate and um, and figure out how you add value. Like you you know, what are you doing that you're bringing to the company and adding value? Let me ask you because that, that that pace of change answer was really struck me because it's not unlike my industry where, when I first got into journalism, I thought I'd be a newspaper reporter for my entire life, and that was a you know, it was a tough, it was a challenging life, but it was, I knew it was, was expected of me. And then in the middle of my career, internet came and everyone got fired and the entire, you know, newspapers that existed no longer existed. It takes a certain personality to thrive in a environment of, of rapid change. And I'm just curious if, if, if by saying that the, that the financial services industry is headed for a period of rapid change, if that's kind of a, as maybe some of them in the audience are thinking here, I want to have a career which is a little bit more sure-footed versus I even thrive in an area of rapid change. Is that, when you, when, if you would advise someone to, to think about how they path out their future, is that something they should take into, into consideration? I, I can't imagine an industry that isn't going to go under rapid change just because technological advances. Right. I, I, look, I look at medicine. I think 20 years from now, we're going to look at treatments for medicine right now as if it were like the mm. dark ages, mm. right? I mean, mm. you know, with the mapping of the genome, with AI, it's going to be a really interesting time. That's going to be fast paced. Financial services is going to be fast paced. I, 
media yeah. fast pace. So I, you know, I think we're, we're living very mellow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So advice is, if you want a little mellow life, become a cowgirl. Jenny Johnson, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> that was great.